Thank you very much, um, dear friends and students. I'm pleased to be here in Dipro um, to present some results of my research on civility and violence in the USSR and, and Russia. And before I start, I obviously would like to thank Prisma Ukraina and my friends at Viadrina for the invitation. It is certainly a great pleasure to be here at the summer school. Um, this lecture will actually not be about understanding or remembering violence, um, although one may argue that Russia and the Soviet Union has plenty of violent memories to deal with. Um, usually when we think about violent memories in this part of Europe, we think about the October Revolution, the Civil War, the Great Terror, and of course the Second World War and the Holocaust. Um, and the very important uh, memory politics uh, that surround all of these events. Um, but today I will not speak about the memory of the so-called Great Fatherland War, rather I will explore the meaning of the Soviet Union's and Russia's more recent uh, wars, Afghanistan, Chechnya, and the ongoing conflict uh, with Ukraine, and I think you know this might be a good idea also in this context, geographical context here in Dnipro. Um, it is often overlooked that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 constitutes the starting point for an alternative memory culture in the post-Soviet realm. The experience of irregular, or also sometimes so-called wild wars, I think is, under, is essential for understanding um, these societies today. Garete Tutschki, or hot spots, is the Russian term that describes these wild wars from Afghanistan, Karabakh, Central Asia, and the Caucasus um, to the ongoing war in Donbass. Neither the narrative about them nor the experience in them fits the heroic model of the Second World War. Rather, violence is remembered as the foremost resource in these conflicts. The tension between the extreme violence of these conflicts and the more or less peaceful worlds of late socialism and post-communism is also, I would argue, at the heart of this experience. But the actors, the men who served in these wars, starting with Afghanistan, have also played an important role, I will argue, in post-Soviet history. Many Afghans, as they were called, made a post-Soviet career in the military, the secret services, or in politics proper. Some of them entered politics during the rule of Gorbachev and Yeltsin. They organized themselves in veterans' organizations to fight for recognition and to preserve the memory of these conflicts. Others joined or formed important informal networks of power. Afghans were present at some of the decisive moments of post-Soviet politics. During the Putsch of 1991, they defended Moscow's White House. In 1993, they bombarded that same White House on orders from Boris Yeltsin. From 1994 onwards, they served and fought in Chechnya. And here we come into our times. Um, some uh, Ukrainian Afghans helped organize the resistance on Kiev's Maidan during the winter of 2013-2014. Initially, we can even observe many went on to fight in the Donbas and some have fallen in this latest uh, post-Soviet war after having survived Afghanistan. Thus, we may detect and discuss continuities of violence from Afghanistan in the 1980s to Ukraine today that will help us better understand the often violent history of the post-Soviet space. Let me just for introduction briefly focus on Kiev and Maidan. You know the pictures. The pictures are just illustrations. They don't have any analytical value. They're just supposed to take you, you know, into these worlds that I'm talking about. Um, the initially peaceful protests beginning in November 2013, first on the Maidan, then also in the rest of Ukraine, have ultimately evolved into violent clashes and as a consequence of Russian aggression on the Crimea and Donbas into actual war. We may argue that the war in Donbas and the violence on Maidan are clearly tied to the history of late socialism and the post-Soviet space. I'll give you one example to start with. Ukrainian activist Oksana Zabushko pointed this already out during the time of the Maidan. She declared 
that the violence in Ukraine may only be understood in its historical context. In January 2014, at a time when the conflict was still mostly limited to Maidan and Kiev, although they are arguably in its hottest phase, she observed that those who terrorized the Ukrainian opposition, those who tore down the Ukrainian flags, kidnapped activists from hospitals and tortured them, behaved very similar to Russian soldiers in the Chechen war. Ms. Sabushko hinted to a specific gesture, and uh, you may see it at the picture. A boot placed at the head of the defeated enemy, an act of violence, of subjugation and humiliation. This pose, she claimed, was typical of the fighters from the North Caucasus. It was an important symbol from the Chechen war. To her, the boot on the victim's head was brought to Ukraine from the battlefields of the Caucasus. It is just a small example that illustrates how the culture of violence and wild wars spread through the post-Soviet space. In my lecture, I will, talk about, I will first talk about the Soviet war in Afghanistan, then about Chechnya, and finally try to draw some line to our present times. The ideas I present to you today are part of, the part of the work on my book about Russian and indeed Soviet society from Brezhnev to Putin, which is one of the results of the International Research Network on Violence After Stalin, which I coordinated in Potsdam from 2011 to 2016. Violence and civility in Russia is a historical theme with a reference to the present. As the peaceful protest of recent years in Russia, and especially the conflicts in Ukraine have shown, there's hardly another topic that has caused more concern than the situation in Russia and U between Russia and Ukraine. These are the dimensions that connect my topic uh, to our present times. As I already noted, among the defenders of Maidan were numerous Afghanistan veterans and many of the Russian special forces that saw action in the Donbas had previously fought in Chechnya, or they were indeed sometimes Chechens. This allows us to speak of a continuity of the experience of violence from the Soviet era up to our present times. I would like to explain to you today what the wars that the Kremlin has fought since 1979 in Afghanistan and during the 1990s in the Caucasus mean for a history of our times. For a long time, we have understood post-communism more or less, especially in Germany, as a peaceful transformation, almost in the footsteps of Francis Fukuyama and his famous idea uh, of the end of history put forward in the beginning of the 1990s, I think it's fair to say that many in academia as well as in European politics have thought that the whole of Europe would eventually embrace liberal democracy. At least that's a pre-2014 position, I would argue. Um, but while this story certainly holds true for parts of East Central Europe, it does not hold true, I would argue, for the post-Soviet space and also, one may say, for Yugoslavia. Um, however, in the last decades, few people care to examine these continuities of violence. Today, I would like to ask what the practices of violence and the resurgence of war meant for the development of Russia and the post-Soviet space. What changes did these wars bring for the Soviet Union, Russia, and the post-Soviet region as a whole? How were they fought? Which practices of violence can be identified and how are they remembered? These questions will help us to better understand the state of affairs in Russia today. <coughs> the sources that I use for this lecture are interviews which were conducted often immediately after the return of Russian or Soviet soldiers from these wars. To understand the violence in Chechnya, I also use reports of civil rights organizations such as Memorial or Human Rights Watch, um, which also describe the violence in the North Caucasus in great detail. Overall, one may say there's a very broad documentation of these wars available, although we don't even have any official records from the Russian uh, state archives. These were not accessible to me, of course. On the basis of my sources, I will introduce you to some of the theories of violence in these and how they relate to these irregular wars. 
In the next step, I will then ask how this approach can contribute to our understanding of violence and civility in Russia and the former Soviet Union, and why the questions asked about violence may lead us to different historical caesuras from the established ones. Apart from the sources, the methodological question of how to approach violent acts remains. Recent violence research on German Gewaltforschung focuses on the analysis of specific situations, on the cultural and spatial contexts where violent acts are perpetrated. Today, I would like to introduce you to the concept of the Gewaltraum, which may be translated as a sphere of violence. In order to understand and analyze physical violence, we must realize that the daily life of soldiers in Afghanistan, Chechnya, or in the Donbas often followed the logic of such a violent space. We will see that survival in this sphere of violence is remembered as being very different from civilian life. The concept as such is based on con theoretical considerations of scholars that, like uh, sociologist Heinrich Popitz, Trutz von Trotter and Wolfgang Zowski in Germany, um, who are often considered to have started a new brand of Gewaltforschung or research on violence, um, which focuses on the nature of the violent act um, and by strictly um, applying it to acts of physical violence rather than allowing definitions that include structural or symbolic violence such as the in the influential concepts of Galtung or Bourdieu. So it is a, uh, also, it was also this strand of research was very much created also as a reaction to the theories of Galtung and Bourdieu because the German field um, of sociology of violence would argue um, that this broad concept of violence of let's say symbolic violence um, um, and structural violence include acts that may not actually be defined as violence, but rather as discrimination uh, and so on. Um, but you know, to limit our research on on acts where actually bodily harm was done, that's actually sort of like the mantra, if you will, of the um, Gewaltforschung in the way that <laughs> we have pursued it in Potsdam. Violent spaces are places where the modern state is absent and violence becomes the most important social and political resource in the human quest for power and domination over others. They are not geographically defined areas. Rather, they might be interpreted as a specific state of mind, a state of emergency that forces people to act accordingly to different values. The experience of extreme violence creates a new frame of reference for the individual. Law and the modern state are largely absent. Opportunities to use force open up. As long as the sphere of violence exists, it dictates the, the conditions and the struggle for survival. In the sphere of violence, and this is paramount to understand, I think, um, the, the actors, in any sphere of violence, there is no institutionalized protection for the weak. The vulnerability of each individual, be it soldiers or civilians, is constantly present. One can escape this logic only by fleeing to a place where the state still exists or by fleeing from life itself. In these Hobbesian spaces, anybody, uh, in the end, I would argue, I mean, if you think it to the end, anybody needs to fight and kill in order to survive or at least be part of a violent group that protects him or her. This was also true for Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan, and to a large extent, especially in the beginning of the war, maybe not so much anymore, but um, we could think of examples from, from uh, Eastern Ukraine that point into this direction. I think to a large extent it is still true even in the Donbas. There is no state to protect people from violence. The wars in Afghanistan and Chechnya did not follow primarily the principles of armed conflict like military necessity, strategy, or proportionality in the, in the use of force, but, in my argument, more or less they were structured by the logic of the use of violence. Let me start with the war in 
Afghanistan. And these are just some pictures to give you an illustration. You know, not everybody might have an idea what, what Afghanistan. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan December 1979 may be interpreted as the end of detente and the beginning of renewed tensions during the Cold War. The long peace since 1945 and the decrease in state violence since Stalin's death in 1953 came to an abrupt end. Until 1989, the Soviet army fought a bloody battle against Afghan insurgents. It was a typical asymmetric war, or partisan war if you want, with no regular front lines, a war fought with complete neglect of international law. The combatants rather acted according to a logic dictated by the most important resource in Afghanistan, violence. At the Hindu Kush, violence was not merely used to overwhelm enemy forces. Physical violence rather was a means to survive and to communicate with the enemy and even with the rest of Afghan society. In the universe of the Afghan war, the use of violence became not merely morally acceptable, it became an imperative and those who skillfully mastered it gained the recognition of their comrades. Nevertheless, it was difficult, especially for the conscript, to get used to living in such a violent space. Their memories show that many young Soviet conscripts and numerous civilian volunteers that went to Afghanistan were initially looking forward to a foreign adventure um, as internationalists, as it was called in the Soviet Union, in Afghanistan. Various motifs played a role here. Escape from their often boring everyday life and late socialism, a youthful spirit of adventure, and even under Brezhnev, I would argue, if you look closely at the sources, the remaining faith in Soviet ideals, the internationalist mission, come up in many recollections. They took the so-called internationalist duty as a challenge. This was especially true for those who came to Afghanistan during the first years of the war, before much about the nature of the conflict was known in the USSR. Young volunteers saw their mission in the continuity of the heroic deeds of the older Soviet generation, those builders and defenders of socialism, behind which they did not want to stand back. I quote a young volunteer nurse who went to Afghanistan in 1980, quote, in the past, heroic deeds were performed because people were capable of self-abandonment. But today, our youth is good for nothing. And I'm the same. There's a war, and I'm sitting here and just sewing new clothes for myself." End of quote. Every generation the Soviets had, er had learned early on had to serve the Soviet state and its major projects. Men from the provinces, they were the majority of Soviet troops, had an airy, often naive view of the military, which was reinforced by Soviet propaganda. Thus, a major in the Soviet artillery remembered, I quote, I actually came to Afghanistan with enthusiasm, just like everybody else. I thought I was needed there. Nikolai, a conscript who served in Afghanistan from 1982 to 1984, said, I quote, Before the war, I lived in Beloyarsk, a working class neighborhood in the territory of Svetlovsk. From childhood on, I had the dream to go somewhere. Best to go somewhere where not everybody went. Since my childhood, I have looked at films and books about the war, the Great Fatherland War, and how these are, you know, how those people fought for themselves. Courage, heroism, and even death, I thought, were so beautiful." End of quote. A civilian employee who also volunteered to serve remembered, quote, I wanted to go to war, but not, uh, uh, but not to one like this one. I wanted to go to a war like the Great Patriotic War." <laughs> End of quote. The cult of World War II had shaped their generation's identity. However, the reality of Central Asia was different from the images of the Soviet film industry and the narratives of war literature. Still, the idea of a necessary mission was kept stubbornly even as late as 1986. The soldier Timur volunteered to serve in Afghanistan, and he remembers, quote, in 1986, I applied on my own terms to go there. At the time, I thought it was the right thing. In their interviews, the veterans certainly stood under pressure to justify themselves. This may be critically remarked 
you know, as far as comes to oral history sources. It seems, however, plausible that many of them actually went to Afghanistan with idealistic notions. This idealism disappeared often as soon as they left the Soviet borders. The fact that positive expectations dominated with some of the soldiers illustrates that even in late socialism, um, official Soviet values still significantly played a role, I would argue. The late socialist world was a frame of reference for the soldiers to assess their experiences in Afghanistan. Their statements about the war allow us to draw conclusions on the perception of Soviet everyday life. It turns out that the soldiers arriving in Afghanistan were disturbed by the following. The loss of personal confidence because of the absence of family and friends, the complete lack of security and the absence of the state, and finally, the escalating, escalating dynamics of violence, the logic of which determined their life in Afghanistan. Kabul and Afghanistan as geographical places were always remembered as were often remembered as foreign and oriental by Soviet citizens. More striking than even the strangeness were mistrust, hostility, and violence, which the soldiers usually experienced very shortly after their arrival. Outside their military bases, the Soviet army moved into a space that at any time could be converted into a battlefield. Vladislav, who was drafted in 1984 into the Soviet army and arrived in Afghanistan after three months of training, describes the contrast between the Soviet Union and Afghanistan in his memoirs, which were published in 1992 in the United States. I quote, I was a boy growing up in quiet and beautiful Leningrad, a boy who loved his parents and obediently went to school. A boy who was pulled out of his life and brought into a foreign country where war took place and life followed different rules. And the most important rule was quite simple. Only those who kill will survive. We were shooting at those who were shooting at us. We killed those who killed us." End of quote. During their first month in Afghanistan, the soldiers understood that the problems of Soviet society, late socialism one may also add, like lack of responsibility, ethnic tensions, fixed hierarchies, emerged ever more clearly during combat operations and in the army itself. This often shook their identity as Soviet citizens. Despite the shortcomings of everyday life of Soviet youth, they were not necessarily all cynical towards the regime and its values, or at least not as much as one might retrospectively think. Many Soviet soldiers believed, as my sources show, in a universal historical mission of building socialism outside of the USSR. In addition, there was the diffuse belief that the Soviet Union possessed a morally superior order that might not be able to offer Western standards of living, but that Soviet policy distinguished itself through a kind of humanism alien to the capitalist world. This very notion was shattered at the Hindu Kush. Several factors contributed to disillusionment. The discrepancy between the official mission and the experience lived, corruption in the army and the strained relationship between the soldiers on a horizontal level, the rigorous mistreatment of newcomers, and finally the extreme violence of guerrilla warfare itself. These phenomena could hardly be brought in line with the sense of identity shared by young Soviet citizens. The idealism of Soviet youth and its notion of um, meritocracy in Soviet society faded away quickly in the barracks and military camps. There, it was not only shortage, but also the danger of that, uh, but also danger that ruled everyday life. The privileges of the powerful and unscrupulous were highly visible here. From the distribution of food and equipment to genuinely military issues such as uh, awarding medals or decorations, which was often also perceived as being done unfair. In all of these matters, the legitimacy of the army, its values and its rituals were at stake. The military life in Afghanistan different, differed in, in, or was just differed slightly, but in a way also reinforced 
the late socialist realities. A system that had long been dominated not by individual motivation and competence, by, but by informal relations and mutual protection, dominated the life of Soviet soldiers. These inequalities led to frustration, especially among conscripts. They had often expected that, given the military challenges in Afghanistan, egoism would ease and sort of like these networks would go into the background and you know you would find a new sense of community on the battlefield that was that is one expectation that you can find very often in the in the sources but after they experienced quite the opposite the afghanistan war was used by the soviet elites as another opportunity to acquire resources and awards preferably without taking much effort or risk this unequal distribution of resources but also the unjust distribution of risks led to the anger of individual soldiers. They lost their respect towards their superiors, towards the officers in the Soviet army. I quote, all encompassing moral corruption had captured our officer corps. Everyone had the urge to get as hold of many things as possible, cassette players, jeans, leather jackets, drugs, end of quote. These conditions made life in the camps and barracks even harder. And we have to remember that, of course, as in any war, you know, so-called soldiering is what most people do um, most of the time. You know, the, the, the uh, quote that you always hear, the famous one is, of course, war is boring, so war does not take place necessarily all the uh, time at the battlefield, but it takes place in the barracks and so on. And that's exactly where this uh, post-Soviet experience um, continued for the, for the soldiers. Um, but let's come to the, to the battlefield. The level of irregular violence was high throughout the whole period of the Soviet occupation. Already at the first operation, the storming of the presidential palace in Kabul in December 1979, Soviet troops showed their determination to fight outside military conventions. They took no prisoners. KGB forces killed Afghan party leader Hafizullah Amin in his very residence. This first battle already foreshadowed the escalation of violence of the upcoming years. Only weeks into the occupation, war crimes occurred, um, occurred regularly in the countryside. Yuri, a regular Soviet soldier, remembers an operation in February 1918, so two months into the war, where an Afghan village was stormed. I quote, Soon after we had landed, an aerial attack began, just as we were told. Although it was obvious that there was only civilian population in the center, we were going down the order to destroy everything that moved. Absolutely everything, I mean, even livestock. End of quote. The same soldier recounts that the enemy was equally relentless. When part of his battalion was encircled, the men were <coughs> killed and mutilated. Again, Yuri. They had been sliced and slashed in a way that I had never seen, not even in the movies. They'd been damaged so badly that many of them had to be sent back in windowless coffins." End of quote. By mutilating the dead, I would argue, the Afghans communicated with the Soviet army. The occupiers were informed that they were never safe, not even after death. Violence structured the relationship between these, both of these parties. Extreme violence, we may argue. In interviews after the war, Soviet soldiers remembered the execution of prisoners as well as civilians. <clears throat> Another Yuri, who was among the first to enter Afghanistan in 1980, recounts the following incident. I quote, uh, Our lieutenant colonel checked to see that everything was in order. Finally, he said, Remember, boys, that I don't need prisoners of war. In spite of the lieutenant colonel's order, four captured guerrillas were brought to our company commander. They had been found killing wounded soldiers on the battlefield. The commander wondered why we had taken prisoners. He ordered us to take them aside and shoot them immediately, which is what happened." End of quote. Within the Afghan sphere of violence, either party hardly showed any restraint. Even civilians were not spared from atrocities. Both the Soviet army and the insurgents created a space where regular military conduct could be perceived as weakness. After their return to the USSR, Soviet soldiers like Vadim found it hard to understand their own actions. He recounts an episode clearly using his civilian frame of reference and thereby distancing himself from the war itself. 
and uh, show you figure one of these ambush situations that were very typical, um, typical for the um, Afghan uh, war, which was of course mostly fought in the in the mountains. Once we were ambushed near a road, there was no reason really to shoot, but people were already prepared to shoot. They'd come to kill. So they began to fire at a nearby village. Of course, they returned fire then from the village. The intelligence troops were called in. They went to the village and made a clean sweep of it, without any real reasons. All of them died." End of quote. What he describes is the routine of violence in the Gewaltraum. Any clash could quickly result in an outbreak of mass violence because both sides used massive retaliation to show the other side that their determination and their superior uh, willpower um, will bring them to victory. Clearly, these atrocities followed a pattern of reprisal and revenge. Since neither side was holding back, the violence escalated quickly and regularly. It was determined by the situation and the emotions of the soldiers, and not necessarily by specific military objectives that needed to be achieved. From the interviews, some typical practices of violence that occurred repeatedly in Afghanistan can be isolated. These include immediate revenge for your own losses, collective punishment of the population for operations of the partisans, and the attempt to outdo the violence of the enemy so as to consolidate one's dominance in the violent space. In Afghanistan, retaliation often took place in form of spontaneous raids. Soviet soldiers entered a village, ransacked houses, stole valuables, injured people, raped, killed. This was not a proportionate military response to any attack by the guerrillas. On the contrary, these raids show that the Soviet army had internalized already the logic of the violent space. As far as it can be reconstructed from the sources, this hardly changed during the entire 1980s. It means that the situation in the violent sphere is actually a continuing uh, one. Um, you know, we don't have actually like a hide of the war that we can identify so much. It was a pattern of partisan warfare, which had also been, which is um, in a very similar notions been described by Bernd Greiner in his famous study of violence in the Vietnam War. The fighting intensified, uh, intensified, excuse me, when the Western powers supplied the Mujahideen with modern weapons. But the informal rules of war remained the same. Apart from the logic of the sphere of violence, there were some in the Soviet army who enjoyed the violence. And this is also important to acknowledge for us, I think, um, if we do revenge, uh, if we do research in violence, excuse me, um, that there are, that there are, if we do revenge maybe too, um, <laughs> if, um, that um, there are people out there um, who are not just uh, appalled by violence, but there are people out there who actually um, enjoy violence and enjoy acting violently. And you can find these in wars, but you can find these, of course, also among football hooligans uh, um, or other um, people who regularly um, engage in a violent act. The American sociologist Randall Collins calls it the, the violent few because he thinks that it is about uh, 10 to 15 percent maybe only of the population, but this is all sort of like um, uh, the very beginning of the, of the research, of course, um, all of this research is only 10, 15, to maximum 20 years old. But I think if we really go into the sources of these conflicts, um, you will often find um, people um, who um, are described as enjoying and not being able to find a life without this violence after a couple of years because they have gotten so used to it and they find a meaning in being um, violent uh, perpetrators. These are by far not all people, of course, who serve in these wars. This is clearly a minority. But this is still a phenomenon that needs to be addressed, I think, in order for us to understand places like Donbass or Chechnya or, or Afghanistan. And, and I'm trying to give you one example of what I, what I mean by you know, people who take violence as a sport, as an enjoyment, and so on. Um, the following interview is with a Special Forces uh, Soviet soldier, and I quote at length um, from the interview in, in order for you to understand it. There was a certain rule, if we go into operation, no one will see us. No one. I remember one ambush in the mountains. We had an old peasant and his son, and they greeted us. Hello, friends. 
Fifteen minutes later, there was machine gun fire and we were surrounded by 30 enemy men. Ever since, I followed the following rule. Every man, every Afghan who sees us, it's a dead man. It's not easy to kill a man. But you know, in Afghanistan, we had to follow this rule. Question, did you also use a knife? Soldier, yes, I did. Actually, we had a competition to kill someone with one stroke. Question, what do you mean? Well, we practice to hit certain spots in order not to have to stab someone 10 times. You find the right spot and you kill them right away. There was no explicit order to kill prisoners. It was just our own rule. It was our law of survival." End of quote. The interview conveys that killing was seen as a necessity. The Soviet soldier put all Afghans under suspicion of being in cooperation with the insurgents. They were all, to him, legitimate targets. The detailed description of killing enemies with a knife emphasized that killing could become a game, even a passion, something to be mastered, maybe even to be enjoyed. The goal was actually to become a better, quicker, more ruthless killer. Not in order to lessen the pain of the victims. The aim was to gain recognition among one's peers, to gain status within the platoon. Through these games, social ties between the soldiers were established. Within the violent space, they constituted a, in German, Gewaltgemeinschaft, or one may say in English, a community of perpetrators bound together by remembering their violent deeds. The sources on the Afghan war reveal excessive violence that may be classified as war crimes. These atrocities can probably not be entirely explained by the presence of the so-called violent few, as I said, a term introduced by, by Randall Collins, which find pleasure in killing. <coughs> Rather, the structure of the sphere of violence itself um, is leading to these actions. A crucial fact is that the Soviet army leadership made little effort to limit violence by imposing rules or enforcing discipline. Until these sources of the military prosecutor's office are available, it will remain unclear how the army actually dealt with these phenomena of mass violence, murder, and rape. There are indications that there were penalties, but they were very arbitrary, often harsh, but also um, displayed very, deter very little deterrent effect over the years. Apparently, the decision to tolerate lawlessness had been taken early in the war and was not revised. It became obvious that the Soviet army wanted to make strength and ruthlessness its trademark in Afghanistan. Maybe they expected to intimidate their opponents in this way. But the actual effect, I would argue, was a dynamic of violence developed that shaped the behavior on both sides. We can observe mass violence that was also used as a means to communicate with the other side, with the enemy, or with the population. Massacres of civilians and prisoners served not only as a pleasure for the violent few, they were also signs of determination to impose one's will on the enemy and to break its power and morale. The Soviet army and the Afghan guerrillas used the atrocities to install fear into others and to show that they were determined to continue to fight this war to the end. Every atrocity would be remembered by those who saw its aftermath. At the same time, the Soviet military followed a familiar pattern of the 20th century. In wars against irregular opponents, international law is usually ignored. You could also point to partisan warfare in the Second World War, or in Yugoslavia and so on, um, Vietnam. I mean, we have ex ample examples of these sort of uh, uh, wars. Um, this, of course, mean, doesn't mean, on, on the other hand, that you know uh, the laws of wars are always observed at uh, in, in regular wars. I mean, to the contrary, I'm not arguing this, but I'm arguing that you know if if we want to understand these wars like um, Afghanistan and Chechnya, we have to really keep in mind that um, international law or the laws of war really play no role in structuring the the conflict. The Wild War in Afghanistan also had its impact on the Soviet Union. Under Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chenenka, the information policy was rather one-sided. I, mean, I could go into more detail, but I'm just going to give you an uh, overview. Soviet mass media repeated the narrative of the internationalist mission. But slowly, rumors about the brutality and the casualties in Afghanistan leaked into Soviet society. 
The discrepancy between reality and propaganda of the Afghanistan mission certainly had a negative impact on the dwindling legitimacy of the Soviet regime. And then this man comes into play. <laughs> Even when Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika began in 1985, little changed in Afghanistan right away, for at least two or three years. Um, it was not until 1988 that a public debate about the war began, actually. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, the history of perestroika is also something that needs to be looked into more. And the, the way, you know, um, the Soviet public uh, space opened up little by little. And Afghanistan is actually um, one of the later subjects that come up. It is not at the beginning of, um, of Glasnost. Um, in January 1989, the last Soviet troops withdrew from Afghanistan. For a long time, the collapse of the Soviet Union is remembered as peaceful. Just remember, you know, the books like Stephen Kotkin, Armageddon Averted, right? It's not an Armageddon, which is, of course, true at the first glance. In fact, though, there were outbreaks of violence throughout the late 1980s, from the Caucasus to Central Asia to even the Baltic states, as we know. However, the collapse of the empire was negotiated. Still, the developments of post-Soviet politics was highly problematic. Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin, only put lip service to Gorbachev's policy of civilizing from above, which is how I characterize perestroika in an essay. Um, you know, I, I think it, is a, it was an attempt, at least by Gorbachev, to civilize society not from bottom up, but as is classically uh, done in Russia, from, uh, from above. Um, in political conflicts, Yeltsin several times relied on the massive use of force. He also made no attempt to reform the army, or hardly any attempt to reform the army or the security services. On the contrary, the longer he stayed in power, the more he collaborated with them. This was, in my view, besides Afghanistan, a key decision for the future of post-communist Russia. The institutional continuity of the security apparatus allowed it to slowly but steadily influenced its, increased, excuse me, its influence after 1991. Finally, it managed to gain power in the silent coup of the 2000s. We can name the events where Russia's elite opted for violence instead of civility, the bombing of the Russian parliament in 1993, and the first invasion of Chechnya in 1994 under Yeltsin, were the greatest use of force against its own citizens since Stalin's time. This also needs to be remembered. It's often overlooked that we have a very peaceful period where under Brezhnev it's hard to imagine to have like tanks and a bombardment like this in the, in the center of Moscow in the, in the 1990s. You know, this uh, hardly arises uh, any um, conflict with the West. This is accepted as the way of doing uh, politics by uh, Boris Yeltsin. He's even um, partially supported in, uh, you know, uh, using this solution and it also I think marks very much the difference to East Central Europe you know this is clearly not the culture of the round table you know you could have also had a round table maybe or have tried to have a round table to to um, solve these um, differences between the presidency and the and the uh, Soviet and uh, 1993 um, but this is you know um, if you talk about violence and civility this is very much the um, the <coughs> complete opposite, of course, um, to a, a round table um, solution. Um, the justification of the use of force and the justification for the wild wars, as I call them, changed, however, in the 1990s. Not internationalism anymore, but under Yeltsin, the, quote, restoration of the constitutional order legitimized as, as the first invasion of Chechnya. In 2000, Vladimir Putin spoke of an anti-terrorist operation. He invented that word, uh, later to be used also by the Ukrainian government. So just to see how also this terminology gets invented and then it is um, in the end used by, by very different uh, actors. But you know, anti-terrorist operation clearly goes back to uh, the second uh, Chechen war and, and, and Putin because now we're fighting terrorism together with the West. Of course, it's a new framing for the same um, or very similar present um, practices. Um, if we look at Chechnya, what's striking, what's striking is the continuity, especially in the violence against civilians. You know, this is very similar to Afghanistan, I would argue. 
As in Afghanistan, whole villages were destroyed, the population was expelled, raped, and often killed. Collective punishment was also widespread. A Russian soldier describes the modus operandi of the army in Chechnya. Quote, if we, fired, if, if we were fired upon from a house, we destroy that house. If we were fired upon from a settlement, we destroy that settlement. End of quote. From reports of the OSCE and Russian human rights organizations, such as Memorial, we know the details of these numerous attacks. I'm not going to go into many more details of the violence uh, uh, here. I think you know the Afghanistan has, uh, examples have already served their cause, hopefully. Because, however, of the different um, and greater presence of journalists and international observers, you hardly had any in Afghanistan, you now had many in, in Chechnya, the Russian army developed different strategies to avoid being recognized. Thus, Russian troops in Chechnya fought for the first time without insignia. You know, this is again something that we now think about the Crimean operation. All the Western journalists were so surprised to see Russian troops, you know, without insignia, with a, a license plate, uh, um, without license plates at the tanks and, and, and uh, armored vehicles and so on. This tactic actually was already developed in Chechnya. And you can see how these different tactics also spread from one place um, to another and these experiences, you know, um, come from one theater and then are used in another theater. And, um, all, um, soldiers in Chechnya were also wearing uh, balaclavas and were driving cars without license plates. This tactic of disguise, which we encounter in today's Ukraine, was developed and perfected during the Chechen war in order to avoid identification by a human rights organization. So the polite or little green man had already exactly been around in the 1990s. They were just called differently. Besides these similarities between the war in Afghanistan and Chechnya, we can also point to differences between the two conflicts. The violence in Afghanistan was often spontaneous and triggered by emotion, revenge being one of them. While we find such uh, situations in Chechnya as well, my sources show that the use of violence in the Caucasus was much more systematical. It was usually exercised not by conscripts, but now by um, professional soldiers, especially in the second uh, um, Chechen campaign. And these professional raids um, were called uh, zachiska, or perch mostly. Villages were surrounded, the inhabitants were deported, hostages were taken, and um, brought to so-called filtration points, or you know, these are actually concentration uh, camps. You can see here a picture from uh, one of these uh, zachiski. Um, let me give you one example. Izachiska took place in the Chechen village of Tsutin Yurt between December 30, 2001 and January 2, uh, 2, uh, 2002. Official representatives portrayed this operation as a successful strike against Chechen terrorists that had been hiding in the village, if you read the Russian military reports. The detailed report by Memorial, which is based on numerous interviews, focuses, however, on the violence against civilians. I quote from Memorial. In the morning, groups of military servicemen entered the village in armored vehicles. On the outskirts of the village, the soldiers detained several men. The home of Kasbek Razmagananov, a refugee from Grozny, is located in the outer region of the village named Zarecha. Between 9 and 10 a.m., armored cars appeared on his street. A group of military servicemen burst into his yard. First, the soldiers made all the men lie on the ground. Then they began to church, search the house. They then led, led all the five men into the street, pulling their heads over their head and loading them into the armored car. Kasbek managed to notice the number of the armored car had been painted over. The armored car drove somewhere. The detainees were beaten around, along the way. They then put Kasbek and his relatives into a gazelle minibus, also apparently confiscated from local residents. Someone's bloody corpse already lay in the car. The soldiers continued to beat the detainees. Soon they were taken to the outskirts of the village where a temporary filtration point had been organized." End of quote. This type of irregular arrest was a standard procedure during the Second uh, Chechen War. This institutionalized raid constituted a formative part of this conflict. The threats and arrests, the violence that caused insecurity and terror were part of the Zachiska, 
and you know part of the the um, story is of course the spread of insecurity among the population nobody knew what would happen to these people who were arrested you know they could be killed they could not be killed it was sort of like this situation of insecurity that was created um, during the um, operations the operation in Tsutsinjurt continued with occasional clashes between the army and insurgents throughout the um, 30th of December. While some inspections on 1st of January went orderly, according to Memorial, other soldiers stole property or threatened residents and demanded large sums of money to abstain from arresting men. Others had to pay money to safeguard their homes or their property. I quote again from Memorial. During the search of the Jankayev's building, the military servicemen threw a local resident out of, their, out of her wheelchair and took 10,000 rubles she had on her. Then the soldiers took 10 chickens from the building. Upon leaving, they threatened Isa Zankayev with physical punishment if she would complain to any officials. End of quote. Houses of worship were not respected either. Quote, during the cleansing operation, the mosque was defiled. Military servicemen entered the mosque and defecated on the carpets. All in all, Memorial found that the 100, that 100 residents on the, were arrested on this day and taken to the filtration point, where they were held for two days. Some people were separated from the others and disappeared. At least five civilians were killed straight away. The whereabouts of many other men remain unknown until this day. The Kontraktniki um, professional soldiers developed their own routine of terror and submission. In Chechnya, looting and kidnapping for ransom played a greater role than in Afghanistan. That's, it was more about property, which I think is very typical for the post-Soviet period. It was less about the violence itself, but it was also about you know, enriching yourself, like the whole 1990s were about irregularly enriching yourself. This could also be seen in the, in the war. Chechen property was systematically robbed and sold. Individuals were held hostage. While the socialist war in Afghanistan hardly threw a profit, the post-Soviet conflict was also a business. The Russian military took part in the irregular market economy of the 1990s. Thus, Chechnya was affected by irregular violence similar to the type in Afghanistan and additionally by the specifics of the transformation, I would argue. Here, social bonds between the soldiers were strengthened not merely through um, common violent deeds, but also by the motivation of making a profit during the war. Again, a sphere of violence evolved with its own rules. The security provided by modern statehood and any form of predictability disappeared from Chechnya. And one may argue that even today under the warlord uh, Kadyrov, um, that this um, Elemental security has never been regained in this part of, uh, of, of Russia, or at least I would uh, argue. Um, it was clear from the start that Moscow had the intention to pacify the North Caucasus through the use of mass violence. Physical violence was a means to spread fear and to interact with the insurgents and the population. Each raid was a threat to those who had not yet been affected. And again, those soldiers who enjoyed violence were drawn to Chechnya. The structures of warlordism continue to uh, change, uh, to shape life there, and uh, um, as I said, until today, little security is offered for the citizens there. Let me make a few concluding points. According to the reports from Donbas, we found veterans of the Afghanistan and the Chechen war on both sides of the conflict, especially initially during 2014-15. Again, in Donbas, the state the pillars of the modern state were deliberately destroyed. While the whole Russian hybrid war against Ukraine is much more complex than operations in Afghanistan and Chechnya, one may argue that it has very similar effects on the ground in Donbas. People have to adapt to life in a space where violence is the most valuable resource. Those who enjoy violence, those who became experts in using violence, are drawn to the sea. It remains to be seen how these armed men that were sent into battle by the Kremlin, but also the fighters of the Ukrainian volunteer battalions and today of the Ukrainian army, can be controlled and eventually reintegrated into civilian life. At least this will be a great challenge, I think. At the moment, as the war rages on, 
um, the violence seems to be more or less contained uh, to the front line, but we also know very little about the actual situation in Donbass. But we may also point again to a spread of violence, for example, the assassination, um, the murder of opposition politician Baris Nemtsov in February 2014 um, was by many Russian journalists interpreted as, as I quote, uh, violence coming home from the Donbass. And we know that the, that the perpetrators by all likelihood were Chechens, which also, again, you know, points to this uh, post-Soviet continuity um, from these um, conflicts. Um, yeah, maybe enough about this. As a historian, the continuities in the experience of violence are difficult to understand. A situation approach using the analytical control, uh, tool of the Gewaltraum, or the violent space, cannot really answer the question of the long-term impact of the experience of violence on larger societies. This is one difficulty of the sort of like, you know, whole concept of Gewaltforschung, you know, it helps us to anthropologically understand and explain these violent situations and what they do with people at the very point uh, of the violent uh, clash and on the battlefield. Um, but how can we translate this into a longer perspective and explain, um, you know, what this does to society? I think one possible solution might be that we, you know, follow these actors, you know, from the battlefield back into civilian life and so on. Um, we have some careers, you know, as I mentioned, that start in Afghanistan and go on until today. You know, maybe this will be one tool to, to follow these people, but I still think it's a quite a great uh, challenge for historians. The because the sphere of violence concept helps to explain why people use violence and it explains social dynamics that evolve from it at a specific point in time, in a specific location, and under very specific circumstances. This can only be a starting point, however. As historians, we must also raise the question of the impact of society on society over time. What happens to those who leave the sphere of violence but do not leave its logic behind? How does violence shape their identity? How will it be remembered? And finally, how will violence end? And how can a modern state be rebuilt? I mean, this is also obviously uh, a problem in all these regions. If you look at Afghanistan, you know, um, um, rebuilding of modern state has failed even under NATO um, occupation. Uh, Chechnya has no modern state after destruction of the Soviet state in the 1990s. And Donbas, we don't know, but it will certainly be difficult um, to construct something like a modern state after the war, however it will end, will end. You know, the examples of Afghanistan and Chechnya just point to the difficulty. It's much easier to destroy a modern state, to create um, this uh, sphere of insecurity, than to go back uh, to establishing a, a modern state. At this point, I think we cannot give a definite answer to these questions. It is clear, however, that the Soviet war in Afghanistan gave rise to a milieu of experts in violence with extreme experiences and knowledge how to use this violence. These experts have served as a resource to the post-communist rulers, not only in Russia and Ukraine, but also in places like Central Asia or the Caucasus. Due to the authoritarian cause in politics and the failure to reform the security forces, these people often find an environment where they can feel like fish in the water. Further, I would argue that the Cesura of Perestroika must be questioned. Wasn't Gorbachev and Perestroika rather an episode than a Cesura? Could the experiences in Afghanistan and Chechnya have been more formative or more influential for Russian society and its elites than Gorbachev's attempt to civilize the regime? My own work and the development of recent years support such a view, I think. The war in Ukraine also points into this direction. Violence is always a behavioral option for humans. This is one of the common places of violence research. Re-examining the post-Soviet space, I would add that violence is more likely to happen there where it has been rehearsed over and over again, where opportunities were created in which perpetrators are not punished but rewarded. This was the case in Afghanistan and Chechnya, and to a certain degree, I would argue, this is also the case in Donbass. These wars have already produced specialist, specialists in asymmetric warfare, which can be used not only on the periphery of Russia, but also in Ukraine, not only in war, but also in civilian life and politics. Thank you very much for your attention.